Speaker is Torkel Klingberg from the Karolinska Institute. Uh, he'll be talking about childhood cognitive development as a skill. Thank you. Um, so I would want to discuss theories on um, the neural basis of child development. So you could say that there are two types of interpretations of development. One is structural maturation. For example, uh, one example would be that you get thicker myelin around axons and that speeds up uh, response time and reaction time. Um, second theory is that of skilled learning. Uh, for example, you can see uh, the uh, changes in the motor cortex when, when you play the violin. And the third uh, version of this is interactive specialization. For example, uh, um, studies showing that exposure to language switches the laterality. So the question here is uh, where do executive functions uh, fall within these three categories? And um, there has been uh, an open question whether executive functions are really uh, possible to, to improve by training, or they have rather been uh, conceptualized as a fixed trait of the individual. But right now, uh, at least in memory, I would say uh, there is evidence of the trainability. So we did the first studies in 2002 and uh, replication in 2005 um, of working memory training, and there are now uh, more than 100 studies out there on, on different types of uh, working memory training. Uh, so that's of course impossible to, to, to summarize here. I'll just show two slides as a background uh, to this talk. So these slides are from a um, recent meta-analysis that a postdoc in my group did, uh, Megan uh, Spencer-Smith. So she looked at specifically the, the method that we have been using, and she looked at randomized controlled trials that had some measurement of inattentive symptoms, so ADHD-like inattention. So here are the 13 studies she could pick out that had inattention measures. So here, the small green dots that you might not be able to see here is, is just the effect showing a systematic decrease uh, in inattention after training with an overall effect size of, of point. Five, which is highly significant. And from this group, she then picked out also yes, just a, a sanity check to look at improvement in visual spatial working memory for non trained working memory tasks. And here again are the effect sites. Uh, the effect sites is here, and as you can see, a systematic increase and average increase in, in points. Uh, so, this is just a small group. Uh, of studies, there are many more, but even just looking at these, the, the effect is, is very robust. But I think it's safe to say now that working memory capacity is improved by training. So the question I want to explore is what are the implications for theories of development? So it's likely that if we show that working memory is a plastic system uh, using computerized training in, in the laboratory, it's likely that the effect is out there, too, uh, in everyday life. So, the first uh, hypothesis point is that, that development of working memory capacity during childhood depends partly on the environment of influence, uh, training through cognitive challenges in everyday life and education. Secondly, I, I propose that the neural mechanisms that underlie training induce plasticity over weeks of working memory training are to a large extent the same as those underlying environmental effects over years. And to be more specific, to try to put out something that is really falsifiable here, uh, I suggest that working memory capacity is associated with uh, functional connectivity within and between frontal and parietal regions. And secondly, that the neural networks underlying plasticity can be partly differentiated from those of capacity, where striatal dopamine receptor D2 activity and frontostriatal white matter connections are more important for plasticity. 
that is potential for change. So that uh, what I'm trying to do is the distinction between capacity on one hand uh, and uh, plasticity. If you map cognitive capacity, for example, working memory capacity over age, the height of the curve would, would be the current capacity. Uh, the slope of the curve would be the, the change over time, the rate, the change, uh, and um, which is what I call plasticity here. So when we look at um, working memory uh, and the mechanisms, uh, there's been a lot done in neurophysiology looking at working memory uh, as persistent activity in both prefrontal and parietal regions. Um, based on this, there are many neural network models, uh, biologically realistic models, uh, where information is coded by persistent activity over time. Um, and one thing that has come out of these studies um, is that models with ro uh, relatively higher firing rate seem to be more stable and also have higher capacity. So let's look at the first uh, or the second specific hypothesis here about functional connectivity. We have used these neural networks models in, in one study to try out different hypotheses about what's happening during childhood development. So we developed a child version of these networks and an adult version. And the adult version uh, was different either because it had stronger connectivity between two different networks or within a network or because uh, the adult version uh, was more specific, simulating uh, synaptic pruning to get more precise coding. Uh, or we had faster connectivity between the uh, frontal and the, and the parietal node. And in this case, um, only the networks, the adult networks with stronger connectivity show uh, uh, higher or better performance, more stable representations, and they also all had higher uh, firing rate, which was consistent with the increase in bone activity that we saw when we compared uh, children and adults. So th this is uh, difficult to look at in humans, but there's a recent uh, publication looking at macaque monkeys performing visual spatial working memory tasks, comparing young, uh, uh, adult, uh, sorry, young uh, monkeys and adult monkeys. And the difference that are sh that's shown here is that the adults have a higher correlation of strength and also a higher frequency, which is then consistent with this uh, models uh, that I've shown. Stronger connectivity has also been shown um, in resting state analysis by uh, Ferrell, Stevens, and others. Uh, this data here shows one of the strongest changes from between children and adults being the strengthening of frontal parietal uh, connectivity here. And in the study by Stevens, uh, the connectivity was also connected to capacity. So let's move to, um, so this was connectivity in development. Let's move to connectivity in work memory training. Uh, Christos Konstantinides has made a, a series of studies of macaque monkeys doing work memory training. Uh, and some of the findings uh, that are consistent is that after training, they see more cells, this is prefrontal cells, with delay activity. And they also see a higher uh, firing rate uh, during the delays uh, in these months, which would be consistent with, with a higher bone activity. That is something that we have seen in, in one study, uh, although I know that there are uh, other studies that also have found decreases uh, in activity with training. I think uh, this is difficult to parcel out and we need to look at behavioral performance, exact behavioral performance during scanning, etc. It's difficult to go from firing rate to uh, bold activity in, in block designs like this. But another data point here on connectivity, this is uh, also a study on work memory training. They tried to get at connectivity with TMS. So they um, had a TMS pulse over the parietal cortex and then used EEG to, to uh, um, 
quantify the uh, connectivity to prefrontal cortex. And so an increase uh, in the horizon to prefrontal connectivity uh, after training. So there is evidence here, as I showed here, both in, in development and training. Uh, let's go to the second point. Um, the neural networks of the line plasticity can be partially differentiated from those of cognitive capacity. And strike atom and dopamine D2 seems to be important. Uh, there has been some uh, training studies showing uh, striatal activity in, training, in working memory training. Uh, also, the study by Dalin and a PET study by Backman, all um, indicating importance uh, of the basal ganglia. There is also some genetic studies that indirectly point to the striatum. In this study, by Nasser de Christ, she looked at uh, 250 children doing work memory training, uh, looked at a number of candidate genes uh, with SNPs. Uh, from these genes, and there were, out of this list, there were only two that were significantly associated with a larger training improvements, and they were both related to the DRD2 receptor. In the follow-up study, we took this particular SNP and looked at uh, the relationship to striatal activity. And this is a study by uh, Charlotte Nimmer uh, that came out this year. And she found, she looked at striatal activity uh, in both in the dorsal and the ventral striatum. Both are correlated with visual spatial work and memory capacity. And she saw that the polymorphism in this SNP uh, was a uh, created an interaction between ventral activity and visual spatial work and memory. So again, this is a SNP we identified from training, telling us something about visual spatial work and memory in adolescence. There are also uh, two uh, studies identifying the DAT one with larger training improvement, uh, again pointing to the basal ganglia because uh, it's pre predominantly uh, expressed uh, in the basal ganglia. So what about development in, in the basal ganglia in D2? Um, most studies uh, in development, development studies of working memory have identified a frontal parietal network, cortical thickness, bold, etc. But few studies have looked at prediction or, or the plasticity aspect. So uh, we have done that in two, uh, two uh, recent studies. In the first study, we used uh, support vector regression. This was a study by Henrik uh, Ullmann. Uh, trying to predict, as we heard in the previous talk here, uh, working memory two years later. So we could show that uh, signals, both both signal, SI signals and brain matter density, could um, was correlated with future working memory. The bold and the F values were the most significant. It's a pretty strong uh, relationship here. But then, what we did was try to parcel out this uh, the signals correlating with current capacity from the signals that said something unique about future capacity. So current capacity was associated with this front bright network, uh, but predictions about the future, the unique uh, variance here, was located to basal ganglia and the striatal frontal loops. We looked at this also uh, with a ROI-based analysis. Uh, this is a study by Fahim Darki, looking at the main effect on working memory as functioning the defined regions of interest, looking at the tracks between uh, these regions and basal ganglia, and she could show that again, when we look at correlations with concurrent performance, we have this correlations with parietal, frontal, frontal striatal, uh, sorry, frontal parietal connectivity, frontal striatal. But when we look at the predictions to future, um, the white matter tracks still remain significant, but we also see uh, the basal ganglia. So this is pretty interesting. Uh, we know that the basal ganglia is uh, involved in implicit learning, habit formation, etc. And now to that we might add uh, working memory training too. So this was some data, some dots trying to connect uh, training and development, and also trying to differentiate capacity with plasticity, uh, indicating, uh, I think, that some uh, similarities in the neural mechanisms between training 
and development an indication of, of uh, the effect of uh, everyday life and education. So when we look at uh, the uh, neurodevelopment and neuroimaging of executive function, at least for working memory, we should also consider a skilled learning interpretation of these findings. Uh, and that's also true, I think, for genetic findings. If you find the correlation between gene X and working memory capacity, it's not necessarily a causality here, uh, but it might be that gene X is contributing to greater plasticity, uh, and so the effect is, is indirect. And another consequence could be that if these mechanisms are the same, it means that we can use cognitive training as a kind of a tool, experimental tool, to explore the role, role of, of different factors in development. So things like uh, effect or nutrition or, or other things are difficult or impossible to control in the development of uh, a study. But perhaps we can, if, if the mechanisms are the same, we could control it during a, a shorter uh, cognitive training uh, experiment and thereby uh, learning more about cognitive development. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for a question or two. And if the next speaker could uh, come up. Thank you, Alex, from the University of Pittsburgh. It was a very nice talk, and it was very interesting. And I noticed your focus on frontal parietal uh, but particularly kind of as, as in the way it's positively related to working memory. But I mean, how about if you look, say, in like, the, like you, do you consider default mode or other regions in the brain as even though they're not active during working memory, what is their role and how does it relate to yeah, this? Yeah, um, no, you, you're right. Uh, we have seen the default mode network activity also correlated with, with, with capacity. Um, we know less about it, I think, because we uh, depart from animal models, we don't know. So that's, that's the traditional models that we work in. But it doesn't exclude other factors. Hi, Linda Wilbrecht from UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm curious if you see any link between D2 when you look at uh, improvement due to negative feedback or improvement due to positive feedback. Um, maybe there might be a stronger link between D2 because it's more likely to be uh, encoding negative prediction errors. Right. Um, we, we haven't looked at that directly. We, we have tried to, to tease out the role of motivation generally, um, and it does not. So in the first genetic study I showed there, uh, there was no overall effect of motivation on how much they improved, but there was an interaction, so a certain allele or, or polymorphism with those individuals with that particular polymorphism, they were uh, dependent on motivation while the other group was not. So it might be genetic subgroups that react differently to, to feedback. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.